You're recording? Thank you for joining us for April's Willow Beach Field Naturalist meeting. I imagine you all with bouquets of daffodils on your kitchen table and fiddleheads shivering on the stove. Has anyone eaten any fiddleheads yet this spring? Oh, geez, I should have brought some. I could have had a bowl of them in the back for you. So look for them there, right there for sure. And uh, dandelions also out there. And we're going to leave them right for all our pollinators, the first pollen and the first nectar, and they're, they're going to be um, very excited about that. So, so welcome and thank you for coming. Um, our land acknowledgement, the town of Coburg respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the traditional and treaty territory of the Michisaga and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the William Treaty's First Nations, which includes Kirk Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Bosali, and Georgina Island First Nations. The town of Coburg respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations have been stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters, and that today remain vigilant over their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Thank you, and moving into club business. Okay, so for anyone that's bored this spring, we still have committees with open spots. So if anyone wants to kind of come and hang out and meet new friends and do a little bit of work, we'd be glad to have you. Certainly let Chris at the back or myself know. Um, Chris also would be happy to take your money tonight. So anyone that hasn't bought their membership, be sure and um, speak to Chris. If you use social media, we're now on Instagram. So something fun for you to play with over your coffee while your little heads are cooking on the stove. Um, and scholarship awards. Oh, I better do the 70th. So, so next month, very exciting, right? It's going to be the Willow Beach 70th anniversary. So um, number one, everyone has to come early. So we're going to start early at 6.45, okay? So we're going to start early, the whole meeting, so that we can have some social time after. We'll have some food again, like we used to have, and, and some, well, not like a, a real food, but we'll have cake. Okay, don't eat your dinner before you come. We'll have cake and, and coffee, and, and you can have um, some great conversation after the meeting. So that'll be exciting. Um, we're also going to have Professor Pricklethorn, who's a terrific uh, tree uh, entertainer and educator. Um, so really good uh, for families, for kids, for children of all ages. Um, so that will be at Peter's Woods on the Sunday. Um, so the meeting on Friday night, I think the Land Trust has a walk on the Saturday. And, and then we'll have Professor Pricklethorn on Sunday. So that'll be exciting. And scholarship awards. Uh, so those will be going out to our high schools in Northumberland County. And so if anyone has a high school student graduating this year um, who they think would be great to receive a Willow Beach Field Naturalist Scholarship, then please give them a little prod and they can find out from their um, respective office um, for an application form or an application form, of course, on our website. Okay, Elizabeth. I'm here. Okay, for front.
Michael Bigger always said that he could only find me if I had a red shirt on. <laughs> yeah. So this morning, first phone call of the day was my sister who lives west of Welcome, and her husband had seen two bald eagles over their farm. Yeah. We, any of you who are on Facebook will know that uh, Jerry McKenna uh, snagged two bald eagles at the at Wesleyville, so it could be the very well be the same too. The farm and Wesleyville are not that far apart as the eagle flies. So that was pretty exciting. If there's eagles breeding in this neighborhood, that would be really nice. Yeah. yeah. So what does anybody else have? I need to have a lot of this. Yeah. So that was my exciting thing, but I didn't see it. So. Yeah, Richard. Yeah. Richard. Yeah, I still have the Merlins flying around my neighborhood. That's Merlins in her neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I have seen three Merlins in Port Hope. Yeah. One was at uh, St. Mark's Anglican, Anglican Church across the street. One of them was in my neighborhood on Durham Street, and the other one was in the cemetery when I went to the bank. <laughs> That's, that was a bonus of going to the bank. <laughs> So there's lots of ruins around. And, you know, 20 years ago, they weren't nesting here. They didn't breed this far south. So that's pretty exciting. But this is exciting stuff. <laughs> this is an exciting time of year. Everything's moving through. And yeah, Richard. Uh, also, a uh, best for sparrow. Actually, a couple of best for sparrows on Gleason Road. Best for sparrows on Gleason Road. Yeah. And uh, the field sparrows. Field sparrows are back. Yeah, I've heard them up at all the rooms. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? Yeah. We have a pair of pileated woodpeckers uh, who have, in the past month, just made a hole in a 30 foot stump of an elm. Uh, and she's in there, it seems to be, most of the time. And we were out in the woods and he was flying around, chattering at us. So, we hope. We hope that there's a pair of pileated woodpeckers that's grafted. Um, we're just going to the 401 on Gully Road. Gully Road, north of the 401. I have to say all this stuff because some people are still are on live. Yeah, so I have to repeat it. Thank you. That would be really exciting. Let us know if they breed. And pictures too. You have pictures. Have you posted them on our Facebook page? <laughs> you could do that. You know. Thanks. What do you have? Question. Okay. Sure. Normally, you don't see an elm being hit by a woodpecker. If it's dead, yeah. No. <laughs> well, because on the, there are bugs that are an elm, but uh, just under the bark. So when the bugs come and the tree's dead, you don't see that. So but if they were building, if they were digging a, a hole in it for nesting, yes, nest cavity, that would be a different thing. You know, I have something interesting. Okay. okay. I heard uh, woodpeckers, okay, banging white. So I looked around, looked around, finally found it. It wasn't a woodpecker. It was a, a blue jewel on a, probably an acorn. It had no way out. He was really hungry. The, the blue jay was attacking the acorn. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. David. I saw at uh, Skullbark Marsh. Marsh. Skullbark Marsh, heard of Merganser. And, and a, they described an American widget. American widget, yeah, that's right. So I've also seen up on Smiley Road, just north of Blue Jay, a metal one. I'll let you know when I see a bobbling. Okay, if you see a bobbling, that would be really, really nice because they're very scarce. Yeah. Um, we had our first uh, clicker field there one week ago, but yesterday was our first bluebird, which is big for us up there, and, and um, also just one. And then today we had our first white crown sparrow. Bluebird and a white crown sparrow on. Marriott. Marriott Road. I should I should remember that. Uh, just north of County Road 9. I have been around some of my boxes at Alderville and 
it was over a week ago, and there were uh, at least two nests that had uh, eggs of bluebirds. Yeah, they're, they weren't complete nests. They probably are now, but they weren't at that time. I need to go around, but I probably won't get there on the weekend because it's going to be pouring rain. We'll have to check our boxes then. Yeah, it, it, if it's good weather, check the boxes because I, I'm sure that there'll be bluebird nests in the sum of the boxes. I, in that really warm spell that we had, I had in my own garden on different days, uh, what was it, an American lady, and the next day, this, these are butterflies, and the next day was a, a red admiral. And these are both butterflies that migrate in. They, they don't s spend the winter here. So it was, it was good weather, I guess, and they moved in. So, and I have, I have flowers in my garden, so that's all. My front yard is not grass. That's how I get directions to my house. It's not a lawn. Many other things grow, but not lawn. Anything else? Yeah. Well, two actually. So, um, Matt. Uh, uh, Mayor. Yeah. Yeah, it said forty-five plus bonnet. Okay. Bonaparte skulls. Yeah. At where? Uh, in flooded firm field immediately south of Primrose Donkey Sanctuary on April tenth. Smaller numbers have um see, have been seen for a few weeks after. Bonaparte skulls, it's pretty unusual, I think, to see them in, a, in an agricultural field, in a wet field. But they have been, I think Suzanne Williams reported some up in that same area on a flooded field. So thank you, Matt. Um, also from Gary, Jerry, sorry. Um, Great Egret, April 13, Wesleyville Marsh. Great Egret, April 13th at Wesleyville Marsh. There were reports this morning from some of the photographers that frequent the AK Skullthorp Marth in Port Hope that there were great egrets there as well. So that's uh, pretty exciting. The great egrets are, I think, are outnumbering the great blues at, at the Presqu'il uh, in the Presqu'il breeding colony. Yeah, Don. Kristen Osborne reports from Presqu'il in the proceedings this week of the of the Tufted Oh, tough to titmouse at Presqu'il. Maybe maybe ours moved there because <laughs> we haven't seen it in a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great again to, today. Uh, Skullthorpe Skull Skull March. Yeah. Who who saw that? Um, and and Tesla and Tesla is one of the the team that. Are doing the atlas uh, uh, around the Skullport Marsh, and they also had a, a great egret this morning. Yeah. She also had black gowns tonight here um, at the same marsh on Monday. Also, black on night here on Monday. So things are coming back. But a week ago, different days in our own backyard, small backyard in Port Hope, we had a brown thrasher just passing through. And uh, an uh, eastern toad in our garden. I don't think we've had many of those, but that was there. Anything can turn up at any time in this this time of year. So what do you got near place? Just to say, but I had the toad in the thresher at your house. Yeah. So this is just the just south of the of the, of the mall in Fort Hope or in Coburn, sorry. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, Richard. Uh, on Monday, it was a very McKenna on the road and we saw uh, Meadow Arts. Charles Rapid, Parabell Rapids, lots of people in there. And uh, uh, three swallows and barcelors. Uh, on Mail Road, Mail Road is uh, in the oh. What, what I call Hope Township, but it's <laughs> West Port Hope. Uh, you had a pair of brown thrashers, meadowlark, and bluebirds. There's often bluebirds on that road. They, they nest in some of the boxes along there. It's pretty, a pretty reliable place to see them. And barn swallows. And barn swallows. Barn swallows and tree swallows. So far, well, I haven't been at the tree swallows in a few days, so I don't know what, what their nesting situation is. It, it's been pretty cold, so they probably won't nest. The, the trigger for 
nesting of tree swallows is the available availability of flying insects. So if there haven't been flying insects, they won't lay eggs because they can't feed their kids. From Micah? Yeah, yeah. Mikey had uh, American, uh, what'd you say, American woodcock. So that's here's coming back now. And you hear them because they, they do a really noisy display flight. And a towhee as well. Yeah. So this next month, this is uh, May is the warbler time. Um, April is more the sparrow time. But May is the warbler time. So there could be any exciting things and there could be anything in your garden. Jamie, have you had anything in your house? Uh, actually, I was walking around with the Frank's place. Okay, Frank's Frank's property. Yeah. yeah I've got a, green. a green heron in the pond. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know that, Frank? <laughs> Good. I haven't seen a green heron yet. So. So there's all kinds of exciting things, and you never know what's going to turn up at this time of year, and it can be in the weirdest places. A few years ago, I had a friend call me from Toronto. They lived near Castle Loma, and there was this weird bird in their garden. It turned out to be a woodcock. It was a description. And, you know, they don't nest there, but they were just passing through. Anyway, happy looking. So, outings. Um, yesterday there was a, a, a early migrants outing uh, led by Chris Ito, and uh, uh, Chris had um, there were ten people out. Uh, they saw twenty six species of uh, birds. It was a beautiful sunny day uh, at the uh, Cobra Conservation Area, uh, and the highlights were uh, green heron and uh, uh, hermit thrush, and I believe you said uh, yellow rock warbler. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, they're starting to come back. It, it was. Uh, uh, I love those sunny days. <laughs> but we're not going to see one for two weeks. It looks like. <laughs> but um, uh, coming up on May the thirteenth, um, pond study with uh, uh, Mark Rupke and the locations yet to be determined. Uh, we have to check on uh, on. Uh, tree situation uh, and wind situation uh, uh, because of dead elms or uh, yeah, uh, not dead elms, dead, dead ash trees and wind uh, problems with those things coming down. Uh, there's going to be an early morning birding event uh, held by uh, uh, Northumberland Land Trust on May the 27th at 8.30 a.m. at Q and uh, Nature Reserve. Uh, Professor Pickle Thorn is going to show up on May the 28th at Peter's Woods. The pickle Thorn. Um, uh, night sights and sounds and a social. Uh, that's going to be on June the 3rd at uh, the home of Marina Scassa. So it's a, a matter of uh, bringing your lawn chair, your binoculars, and your ears uh, to uh, uh, watch and listen for uh, evening birds like uh, whippoorwills, uh, woodcocks, uh, and uh, bats, uh, uh, so that should be that should be interesting. And um, then uh, there's the uh, Lake Ontario Shoreline and Wetlands outing. That's by uh, that's being held by uh, Northumberland Land Trust at the uh, Jack Van Nordstrom uh, Nature Reserve, and the leader is David Geel. Um, we're we're uh, playing on a wildflower outing on June the twenty fourth. And uh, we still have to confirm who's going to lead that and where that will be. And uh, uh, butterfly outing on July the 9th, uh, Roger Ross is going to lead that and the location is yet to be determined on that. Uh, and we have some other plans coming, you know, going forward uh, into the summer, but we, we have to uh, confirm those yet. So look forward to seeing you out there. And uh, unfortunately we had to cancel our um, astronomy outing uh, with the, the uh, Lyrid 
um, meteor shower because uh, we couldn't see anything. Cloud cover, <laughs> one of the hazards of astronomy. Uh, now I'd like to talk, call on Dawn uh, where you, to introduce our speaker. Evening. Kayla Darling is a species at risk ecologist with Blazing Star Environmental. She holds an honors degree in biology from Trent University and a diploma in ecosystems management from Fleming College. Kayla has experience working with species at risk reptiles with a focus on turtles. She also has experience in the removal and management of various invasive plant species. Kayla is currently coordinating a project which is taking place at the Jack Van Nostrand Nature Reserve involving an isolated population of Blanding's turtles facing risks, including habitat fragmentation, invasive species, and road mortality. As one of a number of Willow Beach Club members who attended the official opening of that nature reserve, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. We welcome Kayla Darling. I just need to. Can everybody on Zoom see my screen? Hello? Um, yeah, all good. Let's take this down. Is that better? Yes. yes. Amazing. OK. So thank you very much, uh, Don, for uh, introducing me. I'm Kayla, and I'm here to talk to you today about the impacts of invasive Phragmites on Ontario's species at risk reptiles. So some of you might have attended, I held an event about a month ago in Grafton, and a few might, might have attended, I think I might see a couple of familiar faces here, um, a kind of speaking about my project at the Jack Van Nostrand Nature Reserve. Um, this is going to be a bit different, so we're, I'm going to be talking a bit more about the actual impacts on reptiles and what that looks like, and then I'll introduce my project as well. So. So I'm gonna start off by talking about Ontario's uh, native reptile species and, uh, and the species of, and those of them that are species at risk. So we have 26 native reptile species in uh, Ontario. We have 17 snakes, eight turtles, and one lizard, which you all might know is the five lion skink. Um, of those 26 species, 19 are species at risk. So it's a disproportionate number of them. Um, some are feder federally and some are provincially, but um, it's quite a, quite a high number in comparison to the number of species. Um, so 10 of our snake species are at risk. All eight of our turtle species are at risk. Um, and our one lizard is also at risk. So I'm gonna bring up a few of our uh, at-risk reptile species. If you, know, if you know the animal, you can shout it out. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very popular one. <laughs> um, this little fella here, dear to my heart, Blanding's turtle, yeah. Um, and then we've got a grumpy fellow over there. Yeah, that's our painted. Technically not, a, technically not, it's a Western, I believe, but. Um, and then the snakes are going to be a little bit more difficult, so. That is actually a queen snake. Oh, queen snake. Queen snake. So they, uh, all of these species that I'm showing you, they all occur closer or in and around wetlands. Um, so this is a queen snake, and they're found often in riparian zone areas. So this is a trick question. It's a, it's a, it's a water snake, but it's a very specific subspecies of our native water snake. It's a Lake Erie water snake. So they only occur kind of the uh, near Lake Erie, they're a very small population, um, and once again, water snakes, so wetlands. And then we have this fellow here. Does anybody know who that is? No, that's an 
Mr. Fox snake. Yeah, so they can be also found in and around wetlands. Um, they can be terrestrial. I've found them in trees, <laughs> but um, they, they do spend some time in wetlands, so. All right, so why focus on species at risk reptiles when talking about fragmentis and uh, the impacts? Well, reptiles are ectothermic. So that means that they are sensitive to environmental changes. I'll get into a little bit about what ectotherms are. I'm sure some of you already know, but it's always good to refresh. Um, and then also they often use wetlands for all or a portion of their life cycle. And wetlands are some of our most biodiverse habitats. Um, and they're just, a, they're just very, very important for a variety of reasons, as I'm sure you're all very aware. Um, but they, they do play host to all of our turtle species and uh, some of our snake species as well. So. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about ectotherms. Um, so ectotherm or ecto outside and therm temperature. That means that they basically regulate their, um, regulate their metabolism using external temperatures or the environment uh, affects their metabolism and how they are able to function. So often when you see turtles basking, that is because they need to warm themselves up with the heat from the sun. Um, this is very, very important. It's the same with snakes as well. Um, and uh, it, it tends to lead to issues when it comes when habitat changes. So this kind of gives, goes a little bit more into how um, the metabolic rate of ectotherms work. I've tried to keep it as low low scientific jargon as possible, but basically, ectotherm their in environmental thermodynamics are responsible for their metabolic regulation. So if for whatever reason, they are not able to get that energy properly, they can't digest their food, they aren't able to reproduce, it can, it can cause a lot of problems. And because they get that metabolic regulation from their environment, they're incredibly sensitive to habitat changes. So how do Phragmites impact wetlands? So they create landscape, landscape and habitat changes. They dry up wet ecosystems by filling up um, the habitat with uh, their very dense stands. They crowd shallow wetland habitat and, and fill it up and then surround deeper pools. So all that's left are the deep pools. And they can impact habitat used for breeding and overwintering, which are very important um, spaces for um, these reptiles. So what is Phragmites? I'm sure we all know what Phragmites is, but it's always good to refresh. Um, it's also known as European common reed. Um, it's an invasive perennial grass species from Eurasia. It was introduced in the 1800s, uh, but we, it spread rapidly with the um, extension of our highways in the 1990s. And now it's found pretty much everywhere in Southern Ontario. It was named Canada's worst invasive plant in 2005. And I would say that it is still holding that title today. It is found in ditches, lake coastlines and wetlands. So how do you identify it? We actually do have a native species of Phragmites. So while this seems kind of silly, I have come across the native species quite often and they are similar enough that this is often useful. So they have large dense seed heads with immature seed heads being reddish purple. You can often tell it's like a tuft, right? The native one has a less dense seed head. Stems can be up to five meters tall. They can be insanely tall um, with a dull beige color with a rough texture. Whereas our native uh, Phragmites does not grow that tall and it tends to have a reddish color near the base. They develop a monoculture, a monoculture being just one plant in one area. Um, and they will form dense stands of living and dead stems that make it difficult for organisms to pass through and for other plants to grow through. So how does Phragmites impact species at risk reptiles? Well, I've spoken a little bit about how it can alter the habitats, um, obviously, but it can change not just for reptiles, but habitat for fish, birds, mammals, and mammals as well. And when an animal's, animal's habitat changes, they have to change their behavior in order to um, overcome this change. So the impacts of Phragmites on SAR reptiles it creates physical barriers to movement, which means that animals are going to have to go further, look further um, for their like, breeding habitat or foraging or whatever it is. It, it creates changes to thermal dynamics, which then creates shade and wind blocks, which then is tied into the um, ectotherm portion of it. So we'll go into how Phragmites impact species at risk turtles first, and we'll talk a little bit about snakes. Turtles are my passion, and um, this also ties into the project that I'm working at 
working on at JVNNR. Um, so it causes loss of nesting habitat. Phrygmites tends to uh, take over riparian zone areas or to more shallow areas um, for, for turtles. And so that is where turtles nest. They'll come up into sandy riparian zone areas and lay their eggs. And that tends to be where Phrygmites likes to grow. We loss of basking habitat. So obviously, once again, if it's really warm out, turtles will aqua bask. They'll bask just under the, uh, the water layer. And if Phragmites dries up that area that's nice and warm for them, they no longer have that. Or it might just simply take away the riparian area where they come up to bask, especially snapping turtles. It can alter their access to food sources. So as I spoke of before, Phragmites changes wetland habitat by essentially removing the shallow habitat and creating deep pools. The shallow habitat is where a lot of organisms often live, insects and things like that, smaller fish, and those are what turtles feed on. So it can often alter their food sources as well. And as I, as I previously mentioned, animals have to alter their behavior to changes in their habitat, and they therefore then have to expend more energy to move around and through Phragmites stands than they would have through, say, natural cattails native cattails, at least natural. Um, so basically, the loss of basking habitat often leads to more energy expended to move through or around Phragmites stands. If they don't have basking habitat, they can't regulate their metabolism and they can't get the energy that they need. So when they then have to move around the Phragmites stand, they're expending energy that they don't already have and don't have necessarily the habitat to regain that energy. And it's a vicious cycle. Um, and so then if you have to you're moving to look for nesting habitat. As we all know, turtles can often travel very far to nest. You have no basking habitat, you're not getting the energy you need. You're then having to expend more energy to move around the Phragmites stand to get to your nesting habitat. It's a very vicious cycle. So it can also, once again, cause dry conditions, as I've mentioned before. So a lot of our turtles are quite aquatic, but there are some that are that prefer shallow water. So for those turtles that do use shallow water, like our spotted turtles, who's an endangered species, um, they will be forced into deeper water, into these deeper pools, and it's not necessarily the best habitat for them. And as, once, as I previously said, it can also create a loss of, or a barrier in reaching nesting sites. So this is something that a lot of people don't consider, though, um, when speaking about Phragmites and species at risk, is how, uh, how removal and control of the, the plant, because of how large uh, it can, the, these stands can be, might impact these animals. So this is um, a marsh master. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one. I took this photo myself. I really liked it because it's called the Fragon Slayer. It's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so what these, these are essentially like marsh tanks. And what they do is they drive into a marsh and they have somebody standing on top with a backpack sprayer and they're just spraying these huge stands. This photo is taken down at Long Point um, where if I don't know if any of you have ever been to Long Point, but the infestation down there was dire. They, it was desperately needed for chemical control. Um, but there's no, like, they can't, you know, choose between where they go and where the turtles are. And so that can, that can cause some issues. Turtles tend to use Phragmites stands for thermoregulation, cover, and hibernation when they have no other option. So I have taken part in several studies where we're looking at how turtles move through Phragmites stand, and they will, if, as long as it's not too dense, use it as, in a similar way that they do with cattails, if there's no cattails around for them to do so. And so when we go in and remove them with things like this, there is a very high chance that they're not going to move out of the way in time because um, they are turtles and they don't know what that is. So they will not actively avoid machinery. And they will then often retreat into the water, vegetation, or substrate, um, which either can be a good thing or it can mean that they end up in the way of the marsh master. So, okay, so we're gonna talk about snakes. Um, snakes obviously don't, don't spend nearly as much of their time in wetlands, so their impacts are slightly different. Um, but Phragmites does cause a loss of uh, basking habitat for snakes as well, especially queen snakes, which are riparian species and the stream species, and um, as well as the Lake Erie water snake. Um, and then impacts of Phragmites control on species at risk snakes. Um, so they will use Phragmites for foraging. Oftentimes, small mammals will live in Phragmites stands, especially if they're drier, um, and frogs as well. <laughs> And then they'll also use it for thermoregulation thermo and basking, um, because as long as it's not too dense, there's still enough sun coming through, it's actually pretty decent cover um, for them. And so they will be in there. And they can be found in both sparse and dense stands. 
There we go. Okay. So how do we lessen the impacts? It seems tough. It seems like a, kind of like a, you know, <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of thing. So before conducting uh, management activities, it is important to consider the activity windows of various species. Phragmites doesn't just um, play home to uh, reptiles, it plays home to a variety of different animals. This particular talk is focusing on reptiles, but it always, is always important that when you are um, considering management of any invasive species that you consider other uh, animals and taxa that might be using the plant and how they might be impacted by the sudden loss of habitat. So as you can see, <laughs> reptiles have a very, very fine window of time when they are active. and. Uh, it tends to be right around the same time as growing season for Phragmites. So planning for it can be a little bit difficult, um, but it is not impossible. So I, I'm sure some of you might have already taken part in some of these management methods, but there are pros and cons to all of them, and some of them are better for when you're trying to deal with species at risk reptile habitat. So the most common for smaller stands is mechanical removal. That means spading, drowning, cutting with a raspberry cane cutter, whatever that might be. Uh, it is the least destructive, um, depending, because um, you can easily go in and target smaller patches, and it tends to be just a person going in as opposed to a whole machine. Um, as well, it, there's no chemicals involved, so you're not spraying something into the water and, and into the ecosystem. The cons, however, are that it's time-consuming and labor-intensive. I personally have removed Phragmites before by hand, and you have to keep coming back year after year after year. It does not just go away after the first spading. You come back several times in that first year and then again and again and again. It's time consuming, it, it, it's labor intensive, especially because it happens during the summer most of the time um, and you don't see the results right away. So then there's chemical. So as I previously mentioned before, we have the Marsh Master. Um, that is for extreme situations. When I was down um, at Long Point, they also had helicopter spraying. <laughs> So there was that as well. Um, you can also just have a backpack sprayer as the, the little yellow guy in the picture is doing. Um, so chemical has its pros, it's highly effective, uh, it's glyphosate, um, and it's less time consuming because you're spraying um, kind of indiscriminately. Phragmites doesn't really have a targeted uh, sort of uh, herbicide use. However, the cons are that it is visually unappealing. The stems die, you have these giant brown dead stands um, and and you should avoid it around sensitive species, which involve amphibians, uh, species at risk reptiles, and obviously both of those tend to hang out in, uh, in wetlands where Phragmites likes to invade. So. so there are some considerations when looking into uh, Phragmites removal uh, around species at risk reptiles. It is important to control Phragmites because as I've previously mentioned, it is, uh, it is threatening to species at risk reptile populations. Um, but you want to make certain that you're able to use the lowest impact control to prevent unnecessary harm. So if possible, mechanical is the best way to go in serious infestations. Obviously, sometimes it is necessary to use uh, chemical to make the habitat more uh, livable for these animals. Um, you need to make informed choices about timing and methods for control. And you need to consult experts if possible during management. And that way you can know. Sorry. That way you can know if you are in fact going to impact any species of risk reptiles, if there are any in that particular wetland that you're looking at um, targeting, et cetera. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my project at the Jack Van Nostrand Nature Reserve. There it is. Um, so I don't know, how many of you know the, the JVNNR property? Okay, cool. I have a little map to show everybody who doesn't know. It's kind of near Grafton, um, but it was acquired by the Northumberland Land Trust in 2016. It is 35.28 acres in size. So it's a decent sized little reserve. Um, it has 400 meters of Lake Ontario shoreline and 29.77 acres of critical habitat for species at risk reptiles. That in, or, and species at risk actually, not just reptiles, sorry. <laughs> um, that includes a coastal marsh, which, uh, I can't remember the exact acreage on the coastal marsh and a swamp. So there's 80% of the property is actually wetland, which is very, very important. And as uh, many of us probably know, coastal marshes are um, very rare in this province. And so when uh, one can be protected, it is important. So this is the map to kind of show you. Got Grafton up here, JVNNR is just down there. So a little bit about the subject of my project. 
So Blanding's turtle, or Amidoidea blandingii, they're medium-sized turtle. They have a yellow chin and a dome shell. Um, one of my favorite uh, little kind of tidbits about them is that in a niche object, they are referred to as the turtle with the sun on its chin, which I think is just lovely. Um, and they tend to, it's, it's really nice, their, their chin is an indicator of their health. So the, yellow, the more yellow the chin, the healthier the turtle. So they live in shallow lakes and large wetlands, um, preferring marshes and things like that. And they're actually quite terrestrial. So they can travel up to two kilometers in one day looking for a nesting site. There was a study done um, looking at, uh, uh, a spatial ecology study done looking at how uh, Blanding's turtles use upland habitat during their active season. And it was found that 74% of the time they were actually in terrestrial habitat. So they, they do move around a lot. They're very, they're very um, mobile little guys. Um, they're also federally endangered. We have the largest populations in Ontario, but they're pretty much non-existent elsewhere. There's a few populations in the Maritimes and they're provincially threatened. And obviously their threats include habitat loss, invasive species and road mortality, especially because they are so mobile and they cross a lot of roads. So the project history. In 2019, two blanding turtles were captured at Jack Van Nostrand Nature Reserve. Previously, there had been no record of turtles in this wetland. Um, and after further investigation, there were no records found of blanding turtles within five kilometers of Jack Van Nostrand Nature Reserve. So these two, I believe they're both adult females, are kind of very, very isolated. It doesn't mean that there aren't more in there. That's something that we're working on. But uh, this was the first um, time that they'd been caught. So at the same time, Phragmites was also identified on the property, a decent amount in the marsh. So, so in 2022, uh, as well, we were wanting to improve the habitat. Uh, basking structures were installed by Northumberland Land Trust volunteers. So. As well, during this time, um, us at Blazing Star Environmental applied for a grant to uh, essentially look for more turtles in the area, establish habitat connectivity, so find more habitat in the area, as well as um, potentially other populations, and then remove the invasive Phragmites and improve the habitat for these animals. So starting earlier this year, in 2023, Phragmites management began and it'll be continuing throughout the summer this summer. So this is what my hopes are for the project future. We wanna determine the full population size at JVN and R. That's gonna take quite a while. And we aren't just looking at Blanding's turtles, we'd like to know what other species are in there. So we're gonna be hopefully capturing everyone we can and marking them so that we can understand exactly how many turtles are in this wetland. We wanna manage Phragmites on the property as well as any other invasive species we find and significantly reduce the threat to this population. We then want to search for other habitat nearby, other on either on private landowners property or um, on any other protected areas and see if we can potentially improve that habitat or just look for more turtles. And once again, work with local landowners to restore and conserve habitat. So have any of you seen this turtle? <laughs> we're near, uh, we're looking for near Grafton. Um, and I have had quite a few people come forward about turtles that they've seen, which is lovely. Um, but obviously, if you're ever down that way and you happen to see one of these lovely little guys crossing a road or basking on a, on a log in some like little wetland off the side of the road, if you could let us know, that would be lovely. Um, this is my phone number <laughs> and my email. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking for them. <laughs> so, and you can also come and talk to me after the presentation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Is that the actual size? That is a blending hatchling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> blending turtles actually get pretty big. So like I've caught some that are about this big. They can get pretty heavy. They're, they're a medium sized turtle. So like snappers obviously are our biggest and map turtles and spiny soft shells can get pretty, well spiny soft shells are huge. But uh, blandings are quite like, they're very domed. They have a high carapace. Yeah, um, their, their hatchlings are itty bitty and very sweet. They're known for having their smile as well. That's a pretty well known feature. So <laughs> yeah. 
anyone has any questions, yeah. At this point in time, have there been documented sightings of a turtle? Um, so I'm not entirely sure. We we didn't we didn't do any surveys last year, um, and I took over this project in the fall. Um, there hasn't been any recorded by us. I did do um, some records research. And it's kind of a little bit of a black hole. There's not a lot there. I'm sure that there are painted and scrappers. Um, we just haven't gotten to go out and actually look for them yet. I have had um, a few. I know that I know that there are records of least bitterns, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, that's we have we don't have anything yet. Yeah. For sure. Um, and does cutting. The red down repeatedly Yes. So there's very specific. There is so the Ontario Invasive Plant Council has a, um, a, a best management practices uh, like whole booklet for this. Um, but I can do kind of an abbreviated version. So essentially, you you want to tucker out the phragmites. So it's gonna you're gonna go out probably early around when they're sending the first, first shoots out. They're going to be putting all their energy into growing upward and you're going to go and you're going to cut that, that basically energy off of the source and remove it. And the plant's going to get discouraged and send up another shoot and you're going to do that again. And each time you do that, you are taking a bit more of the plant's energy out of it and it's not able to photosynthesize and then store more energy in its uh, roots and its um, rhizomes. So it takes it takes time. It's it's a torturous process, but it, it, it does work eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What management technique are you going to be using? So we are currently, we have, we're going to do some cut and drown. We have managed a small patch that's kind of like up um, in the swamp area, closer to the swamp area. We haven't gotten a chance to get into the main patch because it is on a, uh, there's like part of the patch is in NLT property and the other part is in a private landowner's property. Um, so we're just managing what we can on the NLT property right now, um, but it will be a lot of uh, cutting and drowning. So you basically cut down the stems using a raspberry cane cutter below a certain uh, depth in the water, and then that will drown the plant. Yeah. We have another um, question in the uh, chat box. Sure. Uh, so Robert Hunt is saying, I have a Fred Mighty's problem and would love to uh, with rehabilitate, um, we have, sorry, a small area, a large area in Great uh, Bay, and he's just wondering if you would have time to evaluate this property for a week. Certainly. So I'm, um, I can, I'm happy to go back to this guy here. How to get that? There we go. <laughs> um, so you feel free to either email me since you're not here in person um, uh, about that. I'm setting up some field visits. I have a couple of other landowners in the area interested, so I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to come out and have a look. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, first, and then. So not necessarily. So there's been um, quite a few studies done, especially with the, there's a wetland ecology lab at University of Waterloo and they've been, who've, who've been doing primarily the research. Um, the amphibians, probably there would be some, some uh, lashback. Luckily they, um, they kind of, they're a lot quicker to reproduce depending, <laughs> um, but not necessarily gonna kill them, no. It might just deter them from being in a particular area. Um, it's tough because it's glyphosate, so it's technically Roundup. That's what we have. There is a new, there is a new um, uh, aquatically approved uh, one that's called uh, Project Aqua, and I'm not entirely sure what chemical that is, but it is technically safe for water use, which is very interesting. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it would necessarily kill the reptiles, but it, it, yeah, it, it's not good. <laughs> it would reduce their food source for sure. Yes. What did you say the lizard was that was endangered? Five land skink. So there's skink. the skink, yeah, there's two populations. So we have two populations of skink in Ontario. One is endangered and one is special concern. So uh, the endangered population, I believe, is the southern population. And then you have the population that's up on the shield and they're they're doing all right. <laughs> they're not they're not doing so bad. It's not something in the example of a little bit about blood puppy. Oh 
Oh yeah, mud puppies. I actually saw some uh, this uh, winter. It is, yeah. Yeah, so they're like neonectic, which means that they never really metamorphosize. So they keep their like larval uh, gills and things like that. They're really interesting. They actually come out in um, cold water more than they do in warm water. So you, when you want to see them, they're, they're more, you're more likely to see them in the winter in an open area, they'll be moving more. Ice yeah, that's that's very common. People tend to like accidentally hook them because they're active and people hook them and bring them up instead of a fish. And they're just like, what is this? And that's, yeah, it's mud puppies. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. On behalf, don't run away. Oh, on behalf of Willow Beach, I have this is not Craig Mighty. <laughs> it's a walking stick. But That's you amazing. Can, you can maybe attach <laughs> as you're out hiking and oh smack it down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Please do that. That was super <laughs> interesting. Um, much of the intro. Okay, so our next meeting and April showers, I now understand, bring warblers. Is that correct? Yeah. It used to be spring flowers, but it also brings warblers. So come um, in uh, May, uh, new discoveries and songbird migration with speaker Bridget. Um, yes, yes, that's who's coming. So that's for our May meeting. Um, and that is a meeting that's going to start at 6.45. We're all going to be early, and we're going to have our 70th anniversary celebration afterwards. Um, so um, we're hoping for a big turnout. So please um, take the time to register in advance um, when you do get the notice. Um, it would be appreciated. Okay, if there's nothing else, meeting adjourned, and enjoy the rest of spring. Thank you.